We're going to spend some time today in Romans 8. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your physical Bibles, or you trust yourself with your phone, you can go to Romans 8 right now. We're in this series called Thrones or Thorns and Thrones, a series on pain. And, and today I want to talk about the idea of God's providence in the midst of our pain, the pain of providence. But I want to start it with a quote that we used two weeks ago, and it, I think it's really impactful. It's from a book called Leadership Pain by Samuel Chand. It says this, pain is a part of progress. Anything that grows experiences some pain. If I avoid all pain, I am avoiding growth. And there are moments in reading that that you go, couldn't we do it a different way? Like, couldn't I grow without pain? No. <laughs> this is how we grow. And so if we avoid pain, we avoid growth. Let's pray before we grow together. God, I pray that you would be the one that speaks. God, I pray that you would, you would help each of us to hear what you want us to hear, that you would guide us. God, I need you. We need you. All of us came in with all sorts of different voices and things that are trying to get our attention. God, would your still small voice be somehow louder and clearer and speak directly to us? God, we need you. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start us off in Romans 8, with 8, Romans 8, 28. Perhaps you've heard it. It says this, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together. For the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. If you've spent any time in church or you've owned any, maybe like a selection of Christian mugs, you've gone to the Christian bookstore, maybe you follow some Instagram pages, you have likely seen this verse. And one of the risks that we have as Christians is we read a verse, and verses are significant, but we forget that there's a lot going on around it. And we read it, just this one little line, and, and we don't notice the context before and after. And so I want to spend some time looking at this verse, but I also want to look at the verses surrounding it, because I think that they are incredibly helpful for us. And just as an aside, I want to encourage you, if, as you're reading your Bible, to not just read in snippets. Read in whole chunks. In fact, the early church and, and those before would memorize whole books of the Bible, would say it. It was all verbal. So they just speak it all out. They didn't speak in little Instagram verses. And so I want us to spend some time looking at the whole context. But before we do... I want to share something with you that I think is really helpful as we look at pain and as we consider our own lives and how we experience change. I want to, I want to actually talk through a framework that's been really helpful for Lee and I. And if you've been around Collective, whether it's for sermons or if you're in a co-group, you may have noticed that how, the, how this has been shaping uh, what we've been doing. So if we, Victoria, if you could just put it up on the screen. This is John Mark Comer's Working Theory of Change. Now, John Mark Comer is a pastor that was at a church called Bridgetown in Portland. He's an author. Now he operates this organization called Practicing the Way. And back in September, Lee and I actually went down to Portland to spend some time with that church. And they had a conference, and we were learning. I've been really shaped by him. And increasingly, there's a lot of things that he does, as I've read that, that have really shaped how I view ministry and are very inspiring to me. And if you've spent any length of time with me, I probably recommended a John Mark Homer book to you because it is a love language to me to recommend it. But I want to look at his working theory of change. Okay, I've talked before about something called spiritual formation. That language is new to you. I just want to let you know you are being formed, shaped. You're becoming someone. And for some of us, that process is intentional, and for many of us, that process is completely unintentional. We don't pay attention to the voices that are shaping us, the, the lies that we believe, or the things that we believe as truth. We don't pay attention to all the things that are shaping us to become who we are. And I want to suggest to you that as followers of the way of Jesus, that we need to embrace a, an intentional practice or strategy of spiritual formation. And so that, that looks like, what does it mean for us to actually change? 
See, the challenge as Christians that show up at church is sometimes we think change just means I listen to some guy talk for a bit, sing a couple songs, and then do life as I want to. But Jesus is not looking for you to follow him in some ways, in some areas of your life. He's looking for whole life transformation and surrender. And so John Mark Homer outlines three different things that are essential to this intentional pursuit of change. The first is teaching. That's happening right now. As I preach or as I teach or as someone is up here teaching, there's this element of unpacking God's truth so that we hear it. And for many of us in the church, we go, that's probably good enough, right? But now you see the other two things, or you see community over here. Now for us, a collective community happens primarily in two places, serving on a team and being around each other, getting into each other's business, and in co-groups. Co-groups are the gatherings that happen outside of a Sunday where we spend time actually pursuing growth together. Community is essential. And if you've been around for any length of time, you would recognize that it's essential because we did a whole series on it last time. And so these two elements, teaching and community. But the gap for many of us is in the third piece, and it's practice. We know we spend time with other Christians, and we, we go, I know I should do some of this stuff. We just never do it. And that's a disconnect. And so for us, we want to be a community that, that recognizes the significance of teaching, community, and practice. All of it empowered at the center by who? The Holy Spirit. He is the one that actually brings life into all of those areas. Now, I want you to notice in the bottom, this is the part that I'll just be fully honest, I struggle with, that, that most lasting change in our life happens over time. Anyone else in here really impatient? Anyone willing to be honest and say, I'm impatient? I wish that God did things instantly all the time. Sometimes he does, lots of times he doesn't. <laughs> And I want him to change me in the areas that I want to change. Now, let's be honest. I think we could go, I want God to change the areas I want him to change really quickly. But the areas that I don't want him to change, if you could just leave alone, that'd be great. And God looks at all of it and goes, no, I want to deal with all of it. And I want to change you over time. But he doesn't change us over time through ease. He changes us over time through the challenges of life. The challenges of life. Not ease, but challenges. And that's why we had a series on community and now a series on pain because it is essential for us to understand this is part of God's plan, that this is how we change. And for some of us, we go, I, I don't really like how God does it. And I get that. I have moments that I feel the same way. But it's important that we recognize that pain, difficulty, and challenges therefore become the catalyst of our growth. They drive us forward, which is why we see what we see in Romans 8, 28. It's why when we read that verse, it holds a different kind of weight for us. Now, let me just give you a little bit of a reminder of context of Romans. Romans is a book that is written by someone named Paul. Now, Paul was inspired by God. These are God's words, but they're given through a human being. And he writes a letter to the church in Rome and he's talking about all sorts of things, but here we find him talking about pain. And I said two weeks ago that we can trust that Paul understands pain because he's been through a lot of it. Paul has been jailed multiple times. The Romans had figured out that if we, if we whip someone 40 times, we kill them. So they did it 39 times, and Paul experienced that multiple times. They tried to stone Paul. He was shipwrecked. He experienced all sort of, sorts of pain. Physical pain, yes. He, he, he experienced betrayal and hurt by people, all the pain. So he understands what we're going through. And what does he say in Romans 8, 28? And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And this verse begins to reframe how we view pain. For those of us who follow the way of Jesus, it causes us to actively reframe the pain and challenges that we face. It doesn't minimize them. I, I never want us to look at the pain that we're feeling and go, you know, the goal as a Christian is just pretend like everything is fine. That is not true. We feel the pain that we feel, but we also put pain in its rightful place. We make sure that we're not letting pain be the thing that defines who we are, but instead who we are in Jesus. 
And this whole process, even as Paul outlines it in Romans 8.28, it causes us, as we're looking at our pain, to evaluate our lives. I don't know what it's like for you, but I find if I'm going through pain, oftentimes my prayers sound like, God, help me out of this pain. God, take this pain away from me. God, remove me from this pain. God, I don't want to feel this pain anymore. God, get, God get, get me out of here. But what we're reminded is that according to Scripture, that our prayers should be less of God, take it away, and more God, use it to redeem me, please. God, do what you need to do. God, I don't see it, and I don't know that I really want it, but use what I'm going through to make me, help me to become who you want me to be. We are invited to look at our pain and actually invite God to use it for his purpose. God can and will use our pain to help us if we're willing to let him. Now, I said that I would explore the context of Romans 8.28, and so I want to go back. Romans 8.28, I want to go to Romans 8.18. Romans 8.18 says this. This is Paul. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we, know, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Even though the believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste. So there is this sense that there are these moments, and maybe you can relate, where you go, this is life as it should be. And you look around you and you go, God is so good. And we have these moments where things, it's just this little, little glimpse of what heaven actually looks like. And then all these other moments where we experience pain and difficulty and suffering and challenges. And Paul says, and yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. So there's this dichotomy here. Suffering now, glory later. It's important that we understand that our suffering now is directly connected, interconnected with our, with our glory later. Suffering now and glory later. This was true for Jesus. Jesus suffered on earth, but he was raised to glory. And we, in the same way, experience difficulties and, and are with him in those difficulties so that we experience the glory later. That there's this interconnectedness between the suffering that we experience and the glory that we experience later. And if this is true for Jesus, if we are followers of the way of Jesus, it has to become true for us. And I'm just not convinced that we struggle or wrestle with this enough. I don't know if I wrestle with this enough. This idea that, that suffering is a part of the process, that glory comes later, but there's suffering in the midst of all of that. And I think that so much of that is connected into the lie that we believe. The lie that we believe about following Jesus is it just should just be blessings on blessings on blessings. That we should just celebrate everything and everything should be easy and good and we should become, we should become life should become simpler as we follow Jesus. That we can somehow experience a life that is free from pain and challenge. The problem is we can't find that anywhere in the Bible. And so that's a lie that we've taken on from culture that is not a reality. If we are going to follow Jesus, it is going to cost us. In fact, it's going to cost us everything. It's going to cost us actually saying, Jesus, you get every area of me, no exceptions. And it's going to, and it's going to hurt us at times and feel we're going to experience that that feeling. And it, but if we look at the Bible, we find no evidence of something other than that. We find Christians that follow Jesus and, and pay that price, but do it willingly, do it with gratitude, do it with hope, because they understand why it matters. And I want you to know that when you experience pain, challenge, and suffering, that in that process, you actually become more and more like Jesus, you take on his characteristics, you handle things differently, you experience life through his lens. 
And over time, as we do that, we become shaped and formed into not our image, but his image. But it's also important that we put pain into eternal perspective, that we understand that there is suffering now and there is glory later, that there's not just a momentary experience, but also that we can understand that there is an eternal component to it. Well, let me just explain to you why I think that's significant and maybe some, an area that I think you could relate to. You ever notice when you're doing something really physical that is difficult physically, it's all you notice? All the other stuff that's going on around you, you don't pay attention to? Like, let me give you an example. Winter in Canada. If you have experienced a really horrible winter, like we used to live in Calgary. Our friend John is here from Calgary, and he didn't bring the snow, so I'm grateful. But Calgary, there'd be times it'd be minus 40. When it's minus 40, and you didn't bring your coat or your gloves or your hat or your, sh- your boots, what do you experience? Agony. And what do you notice in that moment? All I feel when I am frozen is, I hate this moment. It's all I know. I don't pay attention to like, well, at some point it'll be better. I'm like, this is horrible. I'm so uncomfortable. I'm in pain. I feel difficulty. You know those moments. Like maybe you're in here like, no, when I feel really uncomfortable, I just go, God, thank you for this gift. <laughs> no, you're in those moments and you're going, I, I am miserable. And yet what's the, what's the reality? Though you at one point faced that real difficulty that felt all encompassing, you're currently sitting in a room that is reasonably comfortable You're pretty warm, you have a comfortable seat, and that momentary discomfort was not the end of your story. How much more for eternity in context? We experience difficulty like those moments, and we've all experienced them in our lives where all we notice is what we're going through, and we're thinking, this is so difficult and challenging. And what Jesus reminds us is that there's more to it than this. That it's like a moment you see, but I have the eternal perspective. And so our sufferings then become, they they get put into the right perspective. We understand that what we are dealing with is not forever, that what we are dealing with is not who and how it will always be. And when we experience actual presence with God beyond this life, when we're face to face with him, all the pain is washed away. And almost like those distant memories that you have when you think about all the things that you dealt with in the face of God, you go, that, that was all helpful and it hurt, but this is better and it was worth it. It just changes and reframes all of what you experience. And Paul says in verse 19, for all creation is waiting eagerly, all of creation, everything that you see around you, waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. This is our hope, freedom from death and decay. For we know, verse 22, that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Do you you see the language that Paul is using here? Pains of childbirth. So he's talking about suffering in the context of pains of childbirth. And, And what's the experience here? All creation has been groaning. And we believers also groan. You ever groaned? Felt that experience? When you're, uh, when you're married and you have kids and you get around other couples that have kids, sometimes what happens, especially if they're young, is the women start telling birth stories. <laughs> and, and typically, you watch all the guys going, you wanna go somewhere else? You wanna, what else? Garage? Garage sounds good. There's no, there's no heat in there? That's fine, that's fine. Because it gets like detailed and you're going, I don't, I'm not sure I wanna know all those things. So I'm going to tell you Lee's birth story. Just kidding. But I am going to talk a little bit about her, about childbirth for our family. Lee, we have two children, Ava and Parker. Ava is six, Parker is four. And when Lee gave birth to our kids, and if you know Lee, you won't be surprised by this, 
she actually apologized for getting too loud. She's like, I'm sorry, I, I know I got really loud. And I'm like, have you met me? <laughs> I, at the hospital. So we, Lee gave birth to Ava in the hospital. I called Lee's parents from the phone in Calgary and was telling them, and the nurse said, sir, please keep it down. <laughs> Everyone on the entire floor heard your wife's birth story. <laughs> I was like, so here's Lee, and Lee's like, I am so sorry for getting loud. I'm going, are you kidding me? Number one, she wasn't. But number two, do you know what you did? Like what you, di what you did was not something that you just go, you know what, if you could just, like it'll be done soon. Just if you could hurry it up too while you're at it. Like that, that is a ridiculous thing. Because for us, we understand that there's a natural part with childbirth that there is groaning. And what Lee was going through Though it was miraculous, and though it was worth it, also involved a significant amount of pain. You don't get the life that comes out of childbirth without the pain of the childbirth. And whether that's, whether that's a childbirth or a C-section, there's pain there. In order to bring new life into the world, there is pain that comes. And we don't look at someone who's giving birth and say, you know what, please stop feeling the pain. You know what, if you could just stop complaining about the pain and just, it's worth it in the end. No, we acknowledge that it's normal that human beings experience pain when they're experiencing childbirth and we go, hey, we're with you. What do you need? How do we help? I wanna say that to say to you, if you are currently going through pain, real pain, and you find yourself groaning, you're like, I'm struggling. I want you to know that we are not the kind of church that wants you to shut up and keep it to yourself. They are, we are not the kind of church that goes, you know what, if you could just have a better attitude, that would be great. That we're the kind of church that says, we see your pain, we see your groaning, don't do it by yourself. Don't groan, don't experience pain on your own. Don't go through difficulty on your own. Make sure that you're bringing that pain to others, that you're experiencing in the context of community. And in the same way as childbirth, I also want to tell you if you're going through pain, you don't have to compare yourself to others. You don't have to look at how others are dealing with pain and go, wow, they seem to have a lot more poise than I do. How come it's so hard for me? It is okay for you to recognize that where you are is different than other people. We don't need to be people that compare. We don't need to look at each other and go, well, I know you're going through pain, but really, my pain, way worse than yours. Pain, Pain is pain, and each of us deal with it differently. The encouragement there is you're allowed to before God feel what you feel. If I look at David through Psalms, when he is groaning and he is in pain, he brings it to God. He doesn't hide it. And so there's this emphasis of don't hide your pain. Don't keep your groaning to yourself. But on the other side, I also want to make sure that as you're experiencing that, in the same way as childbirth, that you don't lose sight of the outcome of your pain. Because the beauty of childbirth is the outcome, right? It would, not be, it would be a lot more difficult if, if it just amounted to, to nothing. For, all women went through childbirth and there was nothing at the end. For, for Lee, she was able to endure the difficulty that she experienced. Why? Because at the end of it, she got to hold our little girl and hold our little boy. And it became worth it. Why? Because you have perspective. Then you're going, okay, the outcome of this is this child. I experienced this pain, but because of this pain, I experienced new life. What if that's true in our own lives? What if the intention is to take the pain that we're going through to actually bring new life in us, that we become new people, that we, that we actually experience change in our life, and as a result of the pain and the groaning, we experience new life. There can be purpose in your pain. There can be new life that comes from your pain. But I also want to acknowledge that sometimes in order for new life to come, just like, just like childbirth, sometimes that pain can be really significant. There's this album by a, a worship artist named Benjamin William Hastings that my sister Lindsay recommended that's really good, has some amazing songs on it. But the one he had was talking about sequoias. 
Sequoias are the giant trees in, the giant sequoias, the giant trees in California. And there was an ecologist, and I, like, you ever find you listen to something and then it puts you on a rabbit trail on the internet? And you're like, I gotta learn about some of this. And so I was reading a little bit more about these sequoias. And what the ecologist said was this, this area of giant sequoias experienced, experienced a forest fire. Now, we look at a forest fire from the outside and we go, wow, that's really destructive. And he was saying that there's three levels of fire in a forest fire. There's low intensity, medium intensity, and high intensity. Now, if we're picking a fire without knowing anything else, if we're experiencing pain and we're picking our pain, what do we want? We want the lowest intensity, right? What's the least that I can experience in order to get the results that I want? But for the giant, giant sequoias, the only way that there can be new life and new giant sequoias is if it's medium or high intensity fire. In fact, in the high intensity fire is where the giant sequoias reproduce, new life comes in a, in a, in a more, in a sped up way, in a more significant way. And so we see this in nature and we see it in our own lives that oftentimes the deepest pain is actually the environment for the greatest growth. And I say that to you never to go, so just, it's fine. We can feel that. I, I can be honest and say, I don't love that. I don't look at that and go, man, God, I'm so grateful that's how you do it. But the truth is, that is how he does it. And so we, we see these glimpses of what it looks like to actually experience significant pain, to experience significant growth. Sometimes in order to get us where God wants us, it takes significant pain. And yet, circling back to Romans 8.28, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We know. Even just these two words, we know it speaks to this understanding that goes deep. Like, when you know something, when you really know something, it becomes this firm foundation for you. And all the other things that you have around that could distract you or cause you to believe something different, you go, no, 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 I, I know. We, we know. But even this verse, it, it provides opportunity for evaluations. Evaluation, what do you know? What are you believing? What is the, the truth that you're believing? What is the lie that you're believing? Am I believing that pain means that God doesn't love me? Have you ever had those moments where you're like, I'm experiencing pain, so it must mean I did something wrong and God doesn't love me? Are you believing that? Are you believing that pain is meant to harm you? Am I believing that all pain is to be avoided? Like if I could just live my life devoid from pain, that would be ideal. Am I believing the cultural view of pain? And what do we know as Christians? We know that God causes everything to work together. God uses everything. All the things that you go through in your life, if you'll let him, God can use all of it. God can use all the pain, all the difficulty, all the change, that with God, if we'll let him, nothing is wasted. That, that gives me just some measure of hope that I go, I don't want to deal with it, but if I'm dealing with it, at least I know God can use it. At least I know that nothing that I'm going through can, it needs to be wasted, that with God, in his hands, that something good can come out of this. That nothing in our life is wasted. No pain, no challenge, no difficulty. And I, and I know that I can say that, and you go, yeah, that sounds nice, but when you're in it, it's really hard to believe it. It's really hard to actually acknowledge that. It's really hard when you're facing something. I've had it where you go, you go, yeah, but not this much. Like, this is too much. But we remind ourselves that God can redeem heartbreak and heartache. That God can use pain and challenge. And I look at my own life, and if we were having coffee, I could share, there's lots of times that you have pain. I have some significant things in my life. And in no way do I think we go like, well, what I've dealt with is, is worse. But I, I do wanna, I wanna share one that I think is, is a helpful one where I experienced significant pain in my life that God actually used. See, what, what I've learned to be true about following Jesus, I'm 37, I've followed Jesus for most of my life, and I realize that when I look back, I'm more aware of what God has done than what I see in the moment. 
And so I used to live in Burlington. I was a graphic designer at a real estate agency. And uh, I lived by myself in an apartment. And, uh, and one day I got called into my boss's boss's office. And I think it was my day off, so that's always a, not a good sign. And she told me, you know, they needed to, they needed to save some money. There was some, some decreases in how much they had sold with real estate. And so they needed to cut some costs. And so my job was being rendered gone. And so in that moment, I'm being told, okay, I've now lost my job. And, and I didn't do anything. It wasn't like she went, your performance is inadequate, so we're letting you go. This was not a performance thing. This was a cost thing. But I still felt like it was like a punch in the gut. Like I'm going, how am I going to do this? And I don't know if any of you are in the room or in your early 20s. Unless you're, unless you're incredibly wise, and, I, and if you are, I hope you are, but I didn't have a bunch of buffer. It's not like I had a bunch of money in my bank account that I was like, well, I'm good. Like I immediately started going, how am I going to pay for rent? How, how am I going to live? I wasn't looking for another job. What is that going to look like? Is anyone else hiring? And so you feel the measure of pain and then all the worries and the second guessing. And then it's the worst because you're by yourself and I had to take the bus. So I'm by myself sitting on the bus like feeling like this small, right? Wondering how to, like why? And I had moments with God where I'm like, why are you doing this? Like, why is this happening to me? Why did I have to lose my job? Why does this all have to happen? I don't know if you've experienced that or some measure of that, where you have these moments and you're like, why? Why do I deserve, I deserve better than this. And so what happened is I'm feeling all this pain and then some things begin to shift for me. And I was going, I'm sitting there in Burlington and if you are from Burlington or love Burlington, that's amazing. I just didn't. And I was like, why am I living here? Like, I, I don't, is this where I want to be? Is this where I want to build my life? And, and so then I began to think, like, what would it look like to move closer to home? What would it look like to, to look back? And so then I applied for a job in St. Thomas. And I got the job as a graphic designer at this, at this dental medical supply place. And I got a place in, in London. And I was thinking, okay, so you know, God redeemed, he redeemed some of that pain. And then one day, in walked this girl, Lee Thompson. And she was interviewing for a job. And, and there's a whole story where the, my manager is like, Tyler, you're the only single one. Is this gonna be a problem? I was like, no. No, we're good. <laughs> and so I met Lee. While we were there, we were friends. Lee came to faith. We started dating and our lives, my life changed because of that. And I can point back to the moment of significant pain that was a catalyst for that. Like, I, I don't think I would have moved. I think I would have just kind of settled into whatever rhythm. But because of the pain that, that God actually allowed me to experience, he used it to change my life for the better. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can look at your life and point to every single thing and go, wow, this is really neat. But I was reflecting on how significant that was for me. Because I remember all the pain that I felt in that moment, losing my job and wondering, how's this going to work? And, and I'll just tell you, in comparison to looking at Lee as she came up the aisle on my wedding day, that pain was nothing. I think this church wouldn't be here without that pain. And so for all of us, we have these moments of pain that God uses and redeems to get us back to where we need to be. And Paul's words here, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. But I also know that for some of us, it means seasons of enduring pain and disappointment in the meantime. I hate the meantime. The hallway, whatever you want to call it, I, I feel like it's one of those things. I, wanna, I, I remember feeling seasons of being in the meantime and wishing more people wrote books on it because it sucks like when you're like, I felt the pain, I'm feeling the pain and discomfort, and I don't know why. And you have those moments, and we endured those moments. If you are currently in a meantime season where it is difficult and you're feeling it, I want you to know I'm sorry, and we're here for you. We have a prayer team, and we have a team that would love to pray, pray with you and for you. But if you're in the meantime, can I just remind you that on the other side of it, there is hope. 
On the other side of it, if God, if you'll allow God to use it, he can use it to do something significant. And if nothing else, I just wanna say to you, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't, don't quit. Don't, don't just throw in the towel and go, it's too hard. Keep going, but do it with other people because we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him. But notice this next part where it says, okay, everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. I want to speak to two kinds of pain. I want to speak to the pain that comes from not following God's purpose, and I want to speak to the pain that comes from following God's purpose. I want to acknowledge in this room that there's a real possibility that there are some people in here that are experiencing pain because they're not following God's purpose that they're experiencing pain that, that is not what God intended, that God is not choosing this pain for you or looking at, he's not saying, yeah, you need to go through this. He, he's going, why are you choosing this pain? There's pain that we choose sometimes that we do not need to choose. So, so for some of us, that pain is because there are things that we're doing when the doors are closed and the lights are off and people aren't around that we know we should not be doing. There are some things that we're getting into that we know are not good. Whether it's websites that we're viewing or people that we're spending time with, there's things that we're doing that we're going, no one really sees. And what we don't understand is it's harming us. And we don't see it. And God looks at us and he goes, I don't want this for you. And you're like, yeah, but you're so restrictive, God. You have all these things you tell me not to do. And he goes, because I love you and I want you to flourish. And you go, but... I don't want to do it my way, and he, or I want to do it my way. I don't want to do it your way, and you choose pain, and I don't want that for you. I don't want you to choose that kind of pain. Or maybe there's pain because of who you're spending time with, and you, you go, you know, it's really hard to follow Jesus. It's really hard to sacrifice and surrender everything, but you don't look at the voices that are shaping you. You're going, yeah, this is so much more difficult. It doesn't need to be as much as it is. Don't choose that kind of pain. Who we surround ourselves matters. Who we have around us speaking into our life matters. I'm not suggesting that you spend time with just other Christians because you're supposed to. I'm suggesting you find people that love you and love God and want to challenge you to be the best version of you you can be. Maybe for some of us, there are unhealthy attachments that we've developed to money and success. And so we experience pain as our identity is placed in our performance and our external things. And we go, I, I feel so much pain in that. And you go, who told you you had to choose that? Maybe it's the pursuit of comfort and the lack of commitment to God and his people. And you're going, you know, I just feel so disconnected from people, but you bail on everything. I just feel so, I see, I feel so disconnected from God, but you never make time to connect with him. My life is so busy. Yes, it's all busy. All of us are busy. But we choose at some degree to say, I'm not going to make God a priority and wonder why it's harming me. I don't want that for people. We don't want that for people. And I want you to know that God can redeem all of that pain. But I do think that we need to pay careful attention to the kind of pain that we are choosing. There's the pain that comes from doing what he says, and then there's the pain from com that comes from not doing what he says. I don't want that for us. Because some of us, we want God's blessing. We want all that God has for us without actually following and embracing God's best. And if, if we, you or we, if I, if we are enduring pain that isn't pain that God intended us for, to endure, wouldn't we want to change? Like, wouldn't we look at it and go, I don't want to, I don't want to pay that. If that's not pain that God's asking me to experience, I don't, I don't want it. I, I, I only want the pain that God is inviting me into. Some of us are not following God's purpose, and whether that's in your whole life or that's in areas of your life. But then there's also some of us that are doing exactly what God asks us to do. And you're living your life, trying your best to follow him in all your ways, and you're experiencing pain, and you're going, did I sign up for this? Like, I don't remember the guy when he gave me an invitation to follow Jesus telling me how difficult it would be. I don't remember that. Clearly, Germany just scored. <laughs> there, there is a possibility that, that we're doing exactly what God wants us to do, and we're experiencing pain. And I want to let you know that God wants to redeem that pain. 
And if you are currently experiencing pain, whether it's pain of your own choosing or pain that God is navigating you through, we continue to hold on to this Romans 8.28 promise, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And you know what the beauty of community is? Is you can read that and go, you know what, I don't even know if I believe it. And I can, having gone through it in, in other ways, go, I can believe it for you. Like in community, we, we laugh when we are laughing and happy and we cry with each other when things are difficult. Sometimes we have to believe for each other when it's hard to believe ourselves. Sometimes that it means our, our community actually going, I, I know you can't see it, don't give up. I believe God's gonna do something, but I'm not gonna give up on you in the meantime. Like I'm, I'm with you and for you to the end. I'm not going anywhere. Sometimes it means our community going, hey, time out, what you're doing, you're choosing some things that are not helpful. But our community can remind ourselves of these truths, this truth, this reality that God will use all of it to shape us and change us and form us and do all of it according to his purposes for, the, for our benefit. And so maybe in the room right now, there are some people and you need to confront some areas, maybe, maybe even the Holy Spirit's doing it right now where you're like, I know exactly what those things are. And maybe I said them or maybe I didn't and you're like, I know exactly the areas that I need to, I need to shift and change that are not working or walking in God's purposes. If that's you, my encouragement is it's not, a, don't just stay with the understanding, do something about it. And more than just doing something about it, because oftentimes our version of doing something about it is, I'm gonna change on Monday. Do you know, you know what's the most impactful thing when you recognize there's an area of dysfunction is when you share it with someone else and say, would you help me? And then you start to do it together. And you go, okay, we're gonna grow together. We're gonna become who God asks us to be. Maybe for some of you in the room, even as you heard my story of, of losing my job, but then through that meeting, Lee, maybe you need to reflect in the past of how God redeemed your pain so that you can endure what you're enduring either in the present or the future. Like you look back and go, God, I, I saw you do it. Like your word is true. Your words are true. You can be trusted. So often we have to look back in order to look forward. Maybe you're in the room and you go, I, I just need to turn back to God. Like I just, I need a relationship with God again. I wanna encourage you with a couple of potential next steps. The first is this. When we worship, and during, during worship as we respond, and after worship, the prayer team's gonna be up at the front. And if you have something going on that you need prayer for or that you're acknowledging, I need to share, maybe you came by yourself and you're like, I need to share with someone, you could share with one of the, the prayer team. You can come up and let them pray for you. If you're experiencing real pain and need to let someone know, let them pray for you, pray over you, believe with you and for you. Maybe you, you go, I, I, need to, I need to just take steps towards community and I need to take steps towards growing in my faith. And, and some of it might be just being consistent on a Sunday. Maybe some of it is on Tuesday, we have a, a worship night at our headquarters space, 471 Ridgewood Crescent. And maybe it's coming and going, God, I wanna, I wanna dedicate some time to be with you. I wanna worship you. I want you to work through me. I want you to minister to me. Maybe it's about joining community, taking steps towards community. Maybe it's joining a team or maybe it's joining a co-group. It's going, I'm not gonna do this by myself. We wanna be, a com we wanna be people as we embrace change of teaching, yes, community, yes, and practice, so what is God asking us to do with what we know to be true? What, what are we going to do in response? Now we looked at the verses before Romans 8.28. We looked at, there we go. <laughs> it's good. Evidently that was a really good one because it's extended. I looked at Romans 8.28, I looked before, and I wanna, I wanna read this passage from Romans 8.38 over you. So would you stand up with me for a moment? I wanna pray this over you, speak this over you, read this over you. Romans 8, verse 35. And if you're in the room, close your eyes, if you're in the room and you go, I need God, I just, whether it's something significant or something small, you could put out your hands in a posture of receiving. Imagine what it's like when a child is getting a gift from God. They put their hands out. And I want to read this for us. Romans 8.35 says this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? 
Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the truth that we believe over the lies that we may experience, that everything that God does has a purpose and all of it reminds us he loves us and he sees us and he is not done with us. 